<laughs> so, our first panel is on abuse uh, of dominance. Um, in the past times, at least in the Bundeskartellamt, we had a proceeding from time to time, mostly in the energy sector and with big tech and this, well, consol consolidated world we live in. It has become a mass phenomena for competition agencies to do these kind of cases. And if I look at my own agency, I really doubt if we are equipped to do these cases in the way we should do. And if I look at the cases before the courts, I doubt that the courts are equipped to do the cases uh, as we should do. Um, I, I was uh, on a panel at Christina's uh, conference just recently and pointed out how long the Meta case is in the orbit of jurisdiction now. It is five years um, and now we get started with the case on substance and Mark van der Waude, he consolidated me and said, look at the Intel case, some of them are already dead who have been dealing with this case. So these cases, they have their own fate, they are difficult, they are lengthy, they are complex, they have legal and, and economic obstacles, and we want to find out today with this distinguished panel what kind of a difference we really make as competition agencies with these cases. Um, it will be chaired by uh, Tommaso Valetti. Most of you might know him. He's been a long-standing chief economist of the European uh, Commission. Today, he's a professor of economics at the Imperial College in London and the director of the Center for Economic uh, Policy Research. And Tommaso, you and your team, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Andreas. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for, to the Bundeskartelam for organizing this um, very interesting conference. Since we talk about conferences, and yesterday it was mentioned, this conference, Christina's conference in Brussels, there is also another conference, we like competition, don't we, in uh, Chicago every year. Uh, this is at the Stigler Center, and, uh, um, and it's happening usually in April every year, and it does attract people from Europe and from the US, so it's a very nice transatlantic conversation. And about five or six years ago, there was a keynote at that conference given by Judge Posner. So he's a legendary figure in, uh, in legal circles. And when talking about abuse of dominance, he was asked about that by the interviewer. Uh, in the US, they call it antitrust generally. Okay? That's section two of the Sherman Act. And when he was asked about antitrust, Judge Posner said, antitrust? It's dead, isn't it? And it was a semi-joke, only semi-joke, because what it was basically alluding to was the fact that in the US, until that year, for the past 20 years, almost zero cases had been run. Maybe not a zero, you can find the exceptions, but very, very few. Obviously, things have changed in the United States since then, so it is possible to you know, change a little bit the trends. Also, if you start from very low numbers, every change looks very big. No, but when it comes to, the, to Europe, which is our conversation, perhaps antitrust, abuse of dominance was dead in the US. In Europe, it has not been dead, but it's not very healthy either. So I wouldn't say it is in a very healthy state. So if you look at the number of cases that we've been running for the past 20 years, again, you, can't, you can come up with some, some cases, but very low figures, especially if you compare it, maybe the comparison is, is not a perfect one, with the constant activities we have on the merger side, which is the topic of the next panel. So, but the use of resources in antitrust and the outcomes on abuse cases is really minute compared to, to, to what we do in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in other parts of competition policy, and mergers being the most important one. So a question for us is, what's gonna happen next? What's gonna happen next? So are we happy with this state? So what are we aiming at? That's a, to that's a topic of, a, of our panel. So I, I'll make some provocative suggestions. I think that what's gonna come from DigiComp, my former employer, amazing colleagues there, is probably even less going forward, and what do I base my conjecture on? Obviously, they're very busy with the DMA. They realize, at least when it comes to digital platforms, that abuse of dominance case don't really work with digital platforms. The time are glacial, as, as somebody said. So, I mean, think of Intel, think of the meta case in Germany, think of this. I mean, by the time things have started being discussed, let alone appealed, 
these companies are dead, okay? So it's too late, it's, it's just too late. So because DigiComp is gonna do a lot and, and has put some resources into the implementation of the DMA, resources are, are not great, we know that, it's not DigiComp's fault, but there are only 40 from the DigiComp side, but what's also, I don't know if it is well known, but some of these resources are not increases from what they had. They've been redirected from antitrust, which means that if you have more resources on the implementation of the DMA, you have less resource to do abuse of dominance cases elsewhere. So um, even if the intentions are great, there are not enough resources that, at that level. So is there an opportunity for national courts, for national competition authorities to fill that, 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 that void? Okay? with the same tools, with different tools, I mean, opportunity or complementarity, can we rely more? Is that, is, is, is that a, a good thing? Obviously, there is also uh, happening at the um, EC level, the, the new guidelines, so DigiComp is gonna be busy with the, with the guidelines. I find it interesting there that even some economists now are pushing for some presumptions when it comes to abuse of dominance. Is this the way to go? I think it is the way to go for sure in merger control. We had a lot of insights from the US and recent changes. And I think it's about time also we start doing that in selected cases in abuse of dominance. This may speed up, at least in terms of time. So can we help in that sense? So coming from the economists, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a strong signal. The economists though, at least the orthodoxy, are very reluctant to accept things such as Know, protecting the competitive process because they don't yet know how to measure that. So they are not yet ready to go that step. So it would be good to know your views about that. There are some, uh, some maybe, maybe, maybe these are peculiarities for, for us economists, but we created, especially in the economics profession, uh, this beast which is the as efficient competitive test that has to go. It has to go. It's so messy. It's so ungrounded on economic theory. It's as a surprise that is still alive. So is it the time to kill it? Is it time to, to kill it? Finally, and then I want to hear, but this is one of the questions I'd be interested in, almost there is, I mean, there's plenty of discussions about antitrust, about abuse of dominance. We have lots of conferences. We have lots of events like this, and we run very few cases. And but when it comes to exploitative cases, we, we, it's, it, it, there's nothing. There, 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 there is nothing. When I ask former friend, current friends and former colleagues at, at DigiComp, they say, well, we are not going to put anything in the guidelines because there is no case law on, on that, so we cannot do that. But yes, but that's like a fig leaf. Are we going to run cases on except? But is there still exploitative abuse in the law, or is it a concept that also has to go? So these are interesting questions. I hope that I would like this very distinguished panel to help me provide some answers that I have questions and no answers. I'm sure they will have answers to some of this. And uh, um, we are very lucky to have a judge, an enforcer, a scholar, a former enforcer, and, and, and current economic consultant, and we also a practitioner. Okay, so I want to introduce each one of them, and we start with Wolfgang. Wolfgang is a, is a Wolfgang uh, Kirchhoff. Is a, is, a, is a judge uh, in, the, in the federal court in Karlsruhe. And I would like to start with you, Mo. What's your take? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Tommaso, for that, uh, let's say, um, colorful and comprehensive introduction. And uh, in my short contribution, I really like to focus on the aims of abuse control and means for facilitating evidence to cope with, in fact, increasingly complex abuse cases. Uh, for about 20 years now, mainstream in EU competition law that has been already sometimes mentioned during this conference has been the more economic approach. And it defined consumer welfare as exclusive goal of competition law. And consumer welfare is for it the product of the efficiency of an economy. That means as long as the behavior of a dominant undertaking is efficient, it will not be regarded as an abuse. German court and authority practice has been skeptical to adopt the more economic approach as the one and only theory for competition law. Also, of course, recognizing 
the really high value of economic analysis in competition law, Germany always pursued further aims with abuse control. In the tradition of auto liberalism, an important aim is keeping markets competitive and protecting individual freedom to compete. This means protecting the competitive process in the market, but not individual competitors as such. Nowadays, the popular catchword for this aim used by the European Commission as well is contestability of markets. And as early as in 1983, the European Court of Justice ruled in Michelin, Michelin 1, a dominant company has a special responsibility not to allow its conduct to impair genuine, undistorted competition. To establish an abuse of market power by a market-dominating undertaking, it is sufficient that such behavior is objectively capable of imp impeding competition. In that case, reduced requirements apply for showing a causal link between market dominance and damaging contracting partners. Freedom of competition was aimed at in the booking com judgment of the Federal Court of Justice in Germany, my court, in 2021. Our main argument to interdict narrow price parity clauses here was the clause did not allow hotels to offer rooms on their own website for a better price than on Booking.com. And that has to be regarded as a serious restriction of freedom to compete. Another important aim of abuse control in Germany is protecting or even creating the freedom of consumers' choice. To give an example, in um, 2020, the Federal Court of Justice ruled that consumers should have a choice between more or less personalized user experience on Facebook. We relied on an investigation of our NCA, the Bundeskartellamt, according to which 46% of Facebook users regard less personal data disclosed as an incentive to use another social media service instead of Facebook. And about 40% 40, 40 of the users expressed willingness to pay for using a social network as compensation for Facebook not collecting data. Now we concluded in that case that Workable competition among social networks would provide consumers with a choice, with a choice between more personalized user experience or less data collection and more limited personalization. And under a workable competition, such offer has to be expected because social networks would want to, great, uh, to, to get greater market coverage. We believe that in protecting or even creating consumers' choice, we improve consumer welfare. However, we are aware that is not in line with what is understood as consumer welfare by the more economic approach. Because we aim for consumer choice as such, and certainly not whatever it costs, whatever it will cost, but without any efficiency test in the single case. The aim of consumer's choice for abuse control is now explicitly recognized by the German legislator. 
Shortly after our Facebook judgment, the new concept of paramount cross-market significance was in 2021 introduced in Section 19A of our Act Against Restraints of Competition. For undertakings falling under this new section, it explicitly may be prohibited to bundle offers provided by it without giving the users, users sufficient choice as to whether and how the bundled second offer is to be used. Okay, now on means for facilitating evidence. Yes, abuse cases become more and more complex. In particular, but not only in the context of digital markets. Rebuttable factual assumptions in the sense of rules of experience may be an appropriate means to facilitate evidence. For such a rule of experience, a high likelihood of the certain event is required. <coughs> However, sometimes it is enough to refer to a general experience of life. To give an example from a recent refusal to supply case before our court, an undertaking concluded price-fixing agreements with its dealers. And in that case, it may be assumed that the undertaking's refusal to supply a price-aggressive outsider, that this behavior is resulting from these price-fixing agreements. Thus, the outsider is entitled to claim damages. It is up to the undertaking to show that it refused supply for legitimate reasons which were not connected to the price-fixing agreement. Keeping in mind the aim of protecting the competitive process may also facilitate the evidence for abuse. In cases of excessive pricing, it is often difficult to prove that a particular conduct actually hinders consumers. To overcome these difficulties in appropriate cases, a detrimental effect may already be found in the fact that working conditions for competition in the downstream markets are distorted by the conduct in question. We applied that reasoning, for example, in the context of contractual regulations on the use of railway lines. So, um, let me conclude. What is needed is defining the aims of abuse control. What is needed when we define the aims of abuse control is now to clip the wings of the more economic approach a little, a little, by a more judicial approach. Freedom of competition and consumer's choice have to be regarded as important aims of abuse control, not minor to efficiencies generated by the behavior in question. Instead, these non-strictly economic aims may overweigh in a case, case-by-case case analysis, efficiency gains resulting from the practice under investigation. And we should consider more rebuttable factual presumptions in the sense of rules of experience, because they may help to cope with increasingly complex abuse cases. However, they require a high likelihood of the event in question. Finally, the aim of protecting the competitive process may facilitate the evidence of abuse in appropriate cases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Volga. That was a very nice view. I particularly like the quote 
clip the wings of an economic approach a little. These are the type of things that on Twitter can go viral in a certain community. So uh, I will get back to something you said later on, but I wanted now, before I go to the panelists, to understand a little bit more on the timing sometimes, which you didn't mention. So I know nothing about the, the German procedures, but I understand that, for instance, the meta case is going to be heard now, and it was decided like five years ago. And so. What is this? What, what, what I said earlier, the glacial timings of this, and by the time, especially in dynamic markets, this is far too late. Is it lack of resources? Like we heard yesterday, there is lots of laws in Germany that cannot be enforced because there's not enough people, or, or is it something which is more fundamental? Why does, does it take five years to hear a case? I think compared with the EU Commission, we do it well uh, in our timing. <laughs> everything is, besides, everything besides is, is relative, of course. But, <laughs> yes, but, of but course. But somebody uh, in the street, that, that, I mean, you have to convince that guy. So how do you convince mm, them? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you, you may have noticed that now in our Section 19A of uh, our Act Against Resistance of Competition, we have a concentration of uh, legal relief at the Federal Court of Justice. Uh, we decide in the first and last instance. However, uh, outside these 19A proceedings, uh, we have uh, to um, uh, offer um, efficient judicial um, protection to um, everybody and to the undertakings in question. We have more instances. We have to um, go uh, through that uh, process. Uh, certainly, the uh, Federal Cartel Office needs some time uh, to come uh, to uh, conclusions and uh, to a prohibition, and then we have uh, two court instances. And I think uh, altogether, after starting the investigation at the federal, at, at the uh, Bundeskartellamt, uh, if we then have in let's say four years or so the final judgment of our court, that is not so bad. Um, it is not really possible to um, speed that up uh, as. Um, uh, proceedings against uh, preliminary injunctions or so. Um, if you, uh, we had that yesterday uh, in a panel, I think that discuss, uh, discussion, do we need regulation instead of uh, the ex uh, post control we have now? But uh, even if you would have regulation, then you we, uh, would have um, judicial um, relief against that. And uh, again, you have the problem that these uh, Proceedings need some time. Okay. Uh, the, the only thing you can do, you can, can offer best efforts, but you, you will need time. Thank you, Wolfgang. So there's a second quote now. So four, four and a half years is not so bad. It's not too bad. That's a, we have two quotes, which is great. Sorry, I'm joking. Uh, but very good, very good. So I'll go next to Benoit. Benoit Curé is a president of uh, Autorité de la Concurrence, the French Competition Authority. He's an economist. He's been in place now for some years. He comes not from the from antitrust economics. He comes from that good or bad. That's great because we need different views. So it's it's fantastic to have uh, to have people with with a different background. I, th I think it's good actually. Yes, yes. We need diversity. So uh, you are a national um, competition authority. I suggested that there may be opportunities uh, for you when it comes to abuse of dominance. What 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 do you, what do you think? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tommaso, and uh, and thank you to uh, to Andreas and his team for inviting me here. Um, I, I I would like to. St Take a step back and start with a uh, with a very general comment on the state of the economy. <laughs> then I will dive into uh, one or two issues. Don't worry. Uh, when you when you look around, when we look around us, we see uh, market power increasing everywhere, much more so in the U.S. and in Europe, but still also in Europe. Uh, we see uh, new industries uh, emerging where. Uh, uh, incumbents will be very powerful. That was a discussion yesterday on, uh, on artificial intelligence, for instance. Uh, and you see market power having broader consequences for society, uh, including for uh, freedom of speech, for uh, the fairness of the, of the voting process, uh, for child protection, uh, for publishers' rights, uh, and so on. And so uh, if we wouldn't be able to use the instruments uh, that uh, the, uh, the, treaty, the EU treaty gives us, uh, that would be a shame, really. Uh, so we need to be able to use these instruments. And yes, merger control has to be tougher. And yes, we'll use the, the DMA or the Commission, as a matter of fact, we'll use the DMA, not us. Uh, 
So there is a tendency to always kind of lean forward and, uh, and, uh, and, want, and to be, be fascinated by the new shiny instruments uh, that, that are coming. Let's start by using the existing instruments, uh, and, and 102 is one of them. So that's my, that's my first uh, statement. I think we have a duty, we have a responsibility to, uh, to show that we can use the treaty in a, in a proper way. Um, and here comes the good news, or the good news that in, in France we've been using uh, Article 102 uh, very actively, uh, and, uh, and we're happy with it. So I may kind of be striking a different tone for the rest of the, of the group here, uh, but uh, we, uh, um, we are happy users of 102. Um, I, uh, I looked at the numbers uh, over the last two years, so 2022-2023. Uh, the French authority uh, took 10 decisions based on 102, um, out of which uh, seven are actual uh, sanctions based on 102, and three are uh, interim measures uh, or commitments, uh, so based on the, on the risk of abuse of dominance, but it's still 102, of course. So that's 10 decisions, um, and that's uh, in a very broad range of industries, so not only digital, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, several of them in the energy sector, uh, also uh, one of them in the, uh, on the joysticks um, for, uh, for gaming, uh, one of them on um, uh, for truck repair in the, in the, small, in the small island of La Guadeloupe. Uh, and that was actually a, an excessive price decision, and we did it very carefully because we, I would agree that excessive prices are extreme, very difficult to, to, to evidence, but we did it in a careful way and we had the right evidence. Um, and uh, it was not only was it uh, across a broad range of industries, but also uh, we did uh, both uh, exclusion and exploitation, Tommaso. So look at the French uh, practice. Uh, we, we, had, we have a number of decisions on uh, exploitative uh, behavior, uh, and uh, sometimes it's even a mix. So if you take this truck decision in La Guadeloupe, so uh, well, obviously it's very tiny, but still interesting, uh, it's a mix of excluding competitors and excessive prices. So you have elements of, uh, of both, and we, uh, we were able to, uh, to take a decision. So, uh, so what's, how, is it, how is it that we could do that and that we, we've been able to use 102 in, a, uh, in, a, in an effective way? Uh, one reason which will, which will go straight to your heart, Tommaso, is that we don't do AEC tests. <laughs> okay. <laughs> might be, might be one, one reason for success. <laughs> uh, so last time we did it, uh, as far as I know, uh, is back in 2020, so I wasn't there, obviously. Uh, that was on packages, um, uh, on, the deliv on packages delivery with La Poste, uh, and it was as a basis for commitments taken by La Poste. And, uh, and so we did an AEC test, and we concluded that the evidence was not good enough to use it. So that's our last experience with AEC. <laughs> Uh, and one reason, actually interestingly, one reason why uh, the evidence was not good enough is that the data wasn't good. And we also, we also issued an opinion um, back in uh, 2018, I guess, not sure, but I guess it's 2018, on, uh, sorry, on rebates, um, where we also concluded that AEC, we, 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 we concluded with a, uh, with, a, with a skeptical conclusion on, uh, on, uh, on using AEC, um, tests, both for uh, modeling reasons, but also for data reasons, which actually, actually kind of uh, uh, relates to a, something I've, I've seen very much uh, since, uh, since I've, I've joined this, uh, the, competition, the competition field. I mean, I'm an economist, as you said, Tommaso, but I'm not an IO economist. I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm, I, do, I, do, uh, I do international macro, which is kind of very far away from that. And so I, you, can, uh, you can trust me for being uh, kind of uh, not, having any, uh, any, uh, uh, not having a vested interest in that discussion. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was really, when I look at all the, the economic studies coming to us, uh, you have great minds working on that and you know, very, very profound uh, ideas and, and crappy data usually. And so what do you do with that? So, okay, that was en, en passant. Uh, so, um, I think data is, a, is actually a big issue in, uh, in competition, uh, but that's not for today's panel. So, so uh, we don't. So we don't. We haven't. We are not that much bothered with AEC tests because we we, we we do our best not to use them. And uh, second, um, 
we've been using a mix of instruments. So we've been, we've been pragmatic and, and flexible. So we've, used, we've been using, when dealing with, with 102 cases in any industry, we've been using a mix of uh, sanctions, um, settlements, um, um, commitments, and uh, interim measures. Uh, and as you, as you know, we've been, as, 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 as a French authority, we've been extremely active using uh, interim measures. We have, over, I think, 30 decisions on interim measures uh, over the last 20 years. We've been, uh, again, uh, using interim measures uh, against uh, Meta uh, last year uh, on, uh, in the market for uh, uh, advertising uh, verification. Uh, we have a series of decisions related to Google and, and related rights, publishers' rights in the sense of the, of the EU directive. Um, and uh, and it, started with, uh, it started with interim measures. And then we fined Google 500 million for not enforcing the interim measures. So you have a mix of interim measures and then a sanction and then commitments. And that might not be the end of the story, but we'll see. Uh, so uh, so we've been, you, you've got to use the toolbox in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a flexible way if you want to uh, if you want to uh, if you want to be successful. Um, so my uh, my my kind of tentative conclusion, and, and we have a nice pipeline, so I can't discuss all of it uh, obviously on this stage, but you have just to take some some. Uh, um, investigations which are public information. We have the, uh, the case against Apple on the, uh, on the App Store, the ATT uh, uh, case, which is not uh, decided yet, still under investigation. Uh, we have uh, interesting cases in, the, uh, in uh, railway ticketing, for instance. Uh, again, that's public information. I'm not commenting on it. Uh, we have uh, done uh, a dawn raid uh, in the uh, GPU um, industry. Uh, which also ties back to the discussion yesterday on the, uh, what's going on uh, upstream, the, uh, the uh, uh, AI value chain and the cloud value chain. Uh, and so these are all interesting cases that may, some of them may end up with a, with a 102 uh, uh, decision. But of course, I'm not, uh, I'm not prejudging on that. Uh, so, um, and finally, finally, uh, you, we can also, uh, 102 can also uh, evolve, uh, and we can also reinvent the way we use 102. And I think one very good example is the Zotovarkas decision. So now we ha we can use we can use 102, uh, and I'm pretty sure we will use 102 uh, for uh, merger control. Of course, in a kind of a, in a kind of orderly and, and limited way, you know, after uh, a merger traditional merger review uh, has been uh, has been uh, exhausted uh, and uh, or hasn't happened. And, uh, uh, and after possibly using Article 22. Uh, but then 102 remains an option uh, for merger control. So you, you can also kind of take back the, the old instruments in the toolbox and, and, and use them in, in new ways, and that's what the European Court has, has uh, allowed us or even invited us uh, to do. So just as a, as a conclusion, you mentioned uh, Tommaso, uh, Judge Posner's uh, statement on, you know, uh, antitrust is dead. Uh, I want to conclude with, uh, with Mark Twain. You know, the, the, the news of my death has been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very nice. And lots to like in what you said, uh, Benoit. And, um, it, and it's interesting to see that different national competition authorities have different views. And, and I'm sure there is lots of uh, cooperations ac across regulators in Europe and uh, learning across institutions. So that's, uh, and uh, you can read French or you can translate easily all the, the decisions. So I also like your very diplomatic response to the as efficient competitor test saying very profound ideas with crappy data. And that's, <laughs> that sums it. And which is also, I mean, apart from the, the, the quote, I think it's interesting for us. We discuss about big, big data all the time. So there is this data doing incredible stuff. And then when it comes to our job, we don't have good data. So all of a sudden, when it comes to our job, these things are not existing, precisely coming from the companies that should sit on those data, and they use those data for doing a lot of stuff in the businesses, which is a nice um, disconnect, I would think. So now we heard from a judge, from a regulator, and now we're going to go to practitioners. I've got, I'm very pleased to have Ingo Brinken. He's a partner at Gleis Lutz here in Germany. Uh, so you are doing things on the ground, uh, you heard uh, from the, the German side. I would ask you um, not to present your CV, which is very long, but if you are going to talk about something 
which you're currently involved in with your company, if you could disclose that in the past couple of years sure. only, not in, 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 in the last decades. But thank you a lot. Appreciate it. Yeah, th thank you, Tommaso. Um, uh, indeed, uh, uh, I, I would like to disclose that uh, I'm involved in some of the uh, proceedings which I would like to mention and uh, which have been mentioned already here. Uh, this uh, particularly uh, concerns uh, the 1980s uh, cases, uh, which Wolfgang Kirchhoff has, has mentioned. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, instructed by two of the tech companies um, who have been subject uh, to the designation and uh, then, then afterwards uh, with regard to certain conduct which has been investigated by, by the Bundeskartellamt. And uh, I, I also recalled, although I almost had forgotten that, um, that uh, in, at a very early stage I have been involved a couple of years actually uh, in, in, the, in the Intel case uh, on the side of the complainant. Um, uh, so preparing uh, or collecting the facts and uh, preparing uh, uh, the complaint to the European Commission. Um, uh, that's, uh, you can take that from uh, the, the, the color of my hair. That, that's really many, many, many years, if not decades ago, um, uh, which is part of the problem which uh, Tommaso has, has already uh, described. So uh, just to disclose that, um, I'm sure um, that uh, uh, I'm also, uh, Tommaso, you may allow me to mention that, um, I, chairman of the uh, Studienvereinigung, the Association of uh, um, uh, uh, Competition Lawyers and Economists. I have to stress that very strongly. Um, so it's a combination of uh, many practitioners, uh, in-house and external uh, advisors. Um, and uh, this also gives me the opportunity to thank Andreas Mund and the Bundeskartellamt uh, for involving us, for inviting us to this wonderful conference and also for allowing us to, to contribute. Uh, we really appreciate that, uh, appreciate that uh, in particular over the, the many years uh, of a very fruitful uh, cooperation. Um, having said that, um, of course, there are certain, I wouldn't say confrontations, but uh, certain different interests involved um, uh, when it comes uh, to, to our involvement in the cases. And I would like to uh, focus uh, on partic in particular on, on, on two to, to major aspects. So one is uh, the, the Intel case, which has already been, been mentioned, and the other one uh, is uh, the application uh, of, of 19A, which uh, I would like to start with, uh, and is, is a good example when it comes to effectiveness, efficiency, also duration of, of proceedings. Um, and as you will uh, take uh, from, from, from my statements uh, in a few moments, I try to, to find a fairly balanced approach, uh, leaving aside my, my personal involvement in some of the cases um, and uh, also taking into, into account uh, what uh, other colleagues who have been involved in these cases um, uh, as well uh, have, have experienced. Um, you may, without getting too technical, um, you, you may be aware that there are uh, actually two, two paragraphs, so two um, parts um, of, of the process, uh, which is the designation, as in case of the, of the DMA, and then afterwards uh, the, the, the review of certain conduct, uh, which is undertaken by uh, the Bundeskartellamt, and then following uh, uh, by, by the court. I, I'm still tempted to say by the courts, uh, um, as Wolfgang Kirchhoff has said. Indeed, it's, there's a, um, a very special situation here that uh, uh, the Court of Appeals in Dusseldorf, who is uh, regularly reviewing um, uh, uh, the investigations of the Bundeskartellamt, has been, let's call it, leapfrogged by the German legislator. So the case is, is exclusively with the Supreme Court in Karlsruhe and uh, the Senate, um, uh, which is presided by, by Wolfgang Kirchhoff. Um, if we simply take the currently four cases, there is a fifth one pending. Um, uh, if we take the designation orders, um, uh, I think it's fair to say, um, very generally and very broadly, without going into uh, the individual details of the, of the four companies, which are um, uh, Google, uh, uh, Amazon, uh, Meta, and, uh, and Apple at the moment, um, you can see that uh, there's a fairly technical approach to applying Section 19A, Para 1, um, which uh, then, then uh, leads to the designation of uh, these companies. Um, and what is, what is, I think, interesting to, to see, all of these proceedings uh, had a duration of, uh, please correct me, uh, roughly a year, which I think is, 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 is a very fair duration of proceedings. It's quite efficient. Um, and it has led to different um, uh, outcomes or situations in the sense that uh, two of the companies have accepted the orders. They haven't challenged it in court. And the other two 
um, have approached uh, the Supreme Court by, by challenging the de decision. Um, um, that's, that's the first step, the first step in the sense um, that the designation, uh, so the basis for the application of uh, the special rules um, uh, under 19A um, are, are reviewed by, by, by the court. And there are in, in, in the law, and you, um, I'm just repeating what, what is there, and most of you know that perfectly well, um, there are a couple of criteria which, which can be invoked and have to be considered. Um, of course, I can't uh, touch all, upon all of them, but I would like to, to mention exclusively one. And I'm a little critical about that, uh, which is uh, the investigation of the position, of the dominant position of the respective uh, company they are undertaking uh, in the or in the markets. I'm not so sure whether this is really necessary. I'm not so sure whether this is really meaningful because uh, the dominant position is subject to either under Article 102, as Benoit has, has mentioned, or the German equivalent in, in Section 19 and 20 of the Competition Act. Um, so I'm, I'm not fully convinced whether uh, it's, it's truly necessary to uh, consider um, the uh, uh, establishment of, of a dominant position in the context of Section 19A. Um, it takes time. Uh, it takes exactly the time for defining the markets and then establishing the respective market position of the companies in these markets. Um, and uh, once again, I'm not entirely sure whether this is necessary for the establishment or for the finding of the uh, paramount significance of that company in, in the markets or across markets. Um, so it could be, and that's my, my first uh, uh, cautious statement, um, I think uh, it, it could be applied somewhat uh, 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 more, more, more lenient in the sense that uh, the, the uh, uh, findings on, on dominance may not be of particular relevance in the context of, of 19A proceedings. Turning to um, the review of the conduct, uh, the Bundeskartellamt um, has singled out in all these four cases um, a certain conduct uh, which is uh, uh, either or has been reviewed for a while or is still under review. Um, uh, and we have uh, at the moment no challenges at, at the court, uh, at the Supreme Court, uh, so it remains to be seen how uh, things develop there. But we can take also, one, once again, taking a very broad approach uh, to, to, to these cases, uh, what we see is it's the obvious attempt, and I think it's, 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 it's worth mentioning that, um, uh, that the Bundeskartellamt uh, takes the view that uh, these cases should be investigated and resolved fairly quickly. Um, so what we have seen is uh, we have cases which, once again, you please correct me, um, with a duration of a year, maybe a little more. Uh, other cases are uh, coming up um, uh, or, or are under, 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 under review at the moment on an investigation um, and may take a little longer. But nevertheless, if you take this all together, um, so only at the level of the Bundeskartellamt and not taking into account uh, the review by the Supreme Court, um, a duration of, uh, say, two, two and a half years to three, three and a half years is, of course, uh, Tommaso, uh, it's, it's, it's not a short term, but nevertheless, in comparison with the duration, the typical duration of many other uh, dominance cases, I think it's, 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 it's fairly acceptable. Acceptable in the sense that it's efficient, it's effective, and it could lead to results um, um, and, uh, 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 which are acceptable for the Bundeskartellamt, but maybe also for, for the undertakings. And, and this leads me to my final observation um, for, for, for the moment, um, that uh, even under uh, Section 198, Paragraph 2, we have seen uh, cases which have been investigated, which have been discussed with the market, they have been market tested, um, and some of the cases uh, either clearly or are in the process of being I don't know whether the term settle is, is really right and correct and appropriate in this context, but nevertheless, um, there is a certain agreement uh, between the Bundeskartellamt and, and the designated uh, undertakings um, that certain changes to the behavior, to the conduct um, uh, uh, should be made. Um, so without going to court in these cases, um, uh, there could be a result at the end of the day which is uh, acceptable to, to all sides. And once again, I, I, I'm mentioning this, and then please, please I apologize for, for, for putting more the focus on the facts rather than on the law, um, that um, these, uh, the, the application of Section 19A could be a good example um, how things could be 
um, uh, could, could be moved, could be improved, could be, uh, 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 could be sped up in, uh, in the sense that uh, the duration is, is not taking longer, 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 um, and uh, also involving the courts only to the extent really necessary, um, which uh, in my view is, um, uh, I think, a, a, positive, a positive development. Um, perhaps mentioning one more critical aspect, and um, Benoit has mentioned uh, the ATT investigation in France. Um, there, there is uh, not only an investigation on this topic in, in, in France, um, there is uh, investigation at the level of the Bundeskartellamt, and also, to the best of my knowledge, in three other um, uh, 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 jurisdictions, um, so other national competition authorities are also reviewing um, the, the ATT program of, of, of Apple. Um, this is rather a procedural aspect. It's, uh, it's not so much a, as a substantive uh, topic which has to be considered. However, consistency and also the um, uh, uh, need for resources uh, in, in dealing with these uh, various uh, proceedings is, is something which, in my view, has, has to be considered. This is not to suggest that uh, I think, uh, uh, Benoit, uh, your authority is, is very much advanced in the, in the proceedings. The Bundeskartellamt has also uh, put a lot of uh, resources and efforts in investigating that case. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's, it's, it's really efficient if uh, then on top of uh, these two uh, uh, authorities, uh, other, I wouldn't say jump on the case, um, but um, uh, uh, consider, uh, consider um, uh, these, uh, these, the, 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 this kind of conduct uh, uh, on, on top of that. So maybe it's not the right approach to, to, uh, to always consider that the European Commission to, uh, shall, shall took over. In, in case of the Bundeskartellamt, it's simply uh, uh, not, not possible, uh, given that uh, the case is at least partly um, investigated under Section 19A2. Um, um, uh, and uh, also in terms of efficiency, given that the French authority seems to be uh, very, very much advanced. Um, but uh, nevertheless, some, some form of more formal coordination within the ECN, I think, is, is, is necessary, um, um, because otherwise we, we simply run the risk that we have too many investigations in parallel, maybe differing theories of harm, and at the end, differing uh, remedies which are discussed and then maybe uh, either accepted or imposed. Um, so that's, that's um, an aspect I would like to, to mention uh, as well. Um, perhaps um, jumping to, to, to Intel for a second, and uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, in particular the duration and also uh, uh, the obvious, in my, my, my view, uh, inefficiency of the process, the entire process. And, and this is not to say, and once again, Tommaso, um, this is not um, um, uh, some, some form of, of challenging uh, the, the economic approach. Um, as I said, uh, I have many members of my association who are economists, um, but uh, I think um, the, the approach uh, which uh, uh, has been voiced by, by, by the Court of Justice in particular may be doing slightly too much. I think it's, it's, it's uh, simply not practical. It's certainly not efficient, um, given that, uh, if I recall it correctly, it was the, the late 1990s when we worked on, on the complaint. We have now 2024. <laughs> more than 25 years, um, we, we see that Intel at that time was clearly a very, very strong company, clearly a dominator uh, in, the, in the world markets with a market share of, of 90%, if not more, um, hardly any competitors. Um, now we have a look uh, at the world as it is today. Uh, yesterday uh, we heard uh, uh, on the AI panel um, uh, uh, how important NVIDIA has become. Uh, Intel wasn't mentioned even. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's a question whether uh, such long, very long proceedings are, are really um, uh, meaningful and uh, are, are clearly not acceptable for neither side, not for the authority, not for the judges, uh, not for the company, neither the complainant nor um, the, the defendant. Um, so um, what I would like to, to address um, uh, very briefly, and I certainly do not wish to, to leapfrog uh, Heike Schwarzer, who is addressing uh, the more formal legal aspects uh, in, in, a, in a second. But uh, what I would like to do is, I'm certainly not 
favoring and suggesting uh, any kind of amendment of Article 102. I, I think that's, that's uh, 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 totally impossible um, and not even necessary in my view. What is, what is I think, uh, sufficient to consider, and then we heard that uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the panel on, on uh, the Brandeisian uh, approach uh, to, to the application of competition law, that the enforcement policy can be shaped in a way which is also acceptable by the, by the courts. And if I simply take, uh, without going too much into the details, what uh, at least how I read the judgments, um, in not only in the Intel case, but also in, in other cases, um, uh, in, in that context, uh, Qualcomm and, and the like, um, it's, uh, in my view, still possible to uh, uh, distinguish, to, to make a differentiation between obvious and less obvious cases. Um, just to give you an example, and without mentioning the name uh, explicitly, uh, but one of the elements which uh, is clearly summarized in, in, in the Intel decision of the European Commission, um, if Intel decided to pay a significant amount annually to a major retailer here in Germany that only uh, computers are sold with chips from Intel, not from competitors. Um, I wonder whether it's really necessary to have an effects um, uh, a based uh, approach in the sense that the effects should be investigated in, in great detail. Uh, in my view, this is such an obvious, blatant violation of, of Article 102 uh, that it's simply not necessary uh, to, to, to conduct such an in-depth uh, review and investigation. Um, um, and once again, and without, uh, again, uh, uh, leapfrogging Heike Schweitzer, uh, uh, this can be done in the context of the application of formulating enforcement policy on the, on the level of the um, uh, Euro European uh, Union. I think we can ask you to draw some conclusions because we need yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I just uh, would like to finish um, uh, my, my uh, few statements on, on uh, 19A. Um, what uh, we may see in the future, at least here in Germany, is uh, the application of uh, the new competition tool in, 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 in 32F uh, uh, para 3 that uh, may also give uh, some, 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 some basis for formulating certain... Um, interventions and, and orders from the Bundeskartellamt in order to um, uh, remedy uh, a conduct which could be subject uh, to, to the, the uh, application of 19A uh, uh, para 2, but could also be considered without um, uh, the, the application or without the in-depth um, uh, investigation and review um, of uh, uh, the rules on the paramount significance of, of our undertakings. Thank you. Thank you, Inga. I saw Wolfgang taking notes when we were talking and Benoit taking mental notes, so I'm sure there will be some <laughs> responses in the next round. But first, I want to go to John, John Fingleton. Uh, I mean, if you know him, he's been an enforcer. He was heading the OFT and he was chair in the Office of Fair Trading before it merged into the Competition Commission in the UK until 2012. And then since 2012, he's been providing economic advisory work via Fingleton Associates. So John, you've seen it this for a long time. Again, as I ask Ingo, if in the past couple of years you've been involved in relevant cases, please disclose, otherwise we won't hear from you. Thank you, Tommaso. Um, and, and Andreas, thank you for inviting me again to speak at this conference. Um, just on the disclosures, uh, my company advises Google, but we, uh, on market studies in the UK and Australia, but we have not advised them in the last five years on anything to do with abusive dominance. In fact, we haven't advised anybody on the defendant side in an abusive dominance case in the last five years. Um, I'm a failure compared to Ingo, but I think that reflects the case pro profile in the UK. We've advised on 10 uh, phase two merger cases, <laughs> um, and the, the UK regime has been very active on mergers. Um, I'm also advising the Australian government on reform of the competition law, and um, as I'm making disclosures, I'll disclose that I have the unique distinction um, of starting a process that has broken up a monopoly. I don't think anybody else in this room, Peter Freeman from the Competition Commission is here, um, it was a joint product within the OFT and the Competition. We broke up an airport's monopoly in the UK. And I struggle to think of an example in a developed advanced country in the last 20 years where a monopoly has been broken up. So I'm very proud of that. Let me start um, with what might seem like a controversial note in a competition conference nowadays, to start with the, the, the consumer. And because people forget about the consumers um, in all of this. My, my fundamental thinking about why we as economists care about competition 
is not just that competition brings down prices to costs, but that that process creates incentives to bring costs down as well. And you get a dynamic productive effect that grows the economy, that grows productivity growth. And, and I think if antitrust isn't able to demonstrate on an ongoing basis, notwithstanding its other order liberal and other aims, which I think are often consistent with that, but if we are not able to demonstrate that ultimately what we're doing is improving things for consumers, but doing so in a way that creates incentives for lower costs over time, I think antitrust will struggle to um, maintain the sort of political favor that it's had in the last 20 years. I think that abuse of dominance in Europe um, has not had the success it could have had. And let me start with my um, experience growing up in Ireland. Ireland, um, when I was growing up, and I'm, I should have said in my disclosures, although I'm in the UK, I, I'm Irish, um, Ireland had a sugar monopoly, a cement monopoly, an airline monopoly, a telephone monopoly, a ferry monopoly. It was riddled with monopolies. And the domestic government was captured by all these monopolies, and nothing ever happened. And we joined the European Union. And so the seminal cases, some of the seminal cases, McGill, Irish Sugar, um, Irish Ferries, Sea Link, um, there's a number of these cases. The seminal cases came from Ireland. And Article 102, or um, 82, as I think it originally might have been when all this was happening, was brilliant at breaking up state-owned monopolies. And I think if you strip out the pharma cases and the recent tech cases, much of the work of DG Comp in the last 50 years has been on state-owned monopolies, Deutsche Post, Bahn, uh, Telecom, lots of margin squeezes in Slovakia, Spain, Poland, gas, electricity, Greek lignite, etc. So as a tool to tackle monopolies created by the state, this is a brilliant tool. These were easy targets because they were usually lazy monopolies and the remedy was to allow entry. And if you want to link that back to the productivity effect, you look at what happened when we liberalized telecoms in Europe, when we liberalized airlines in Europe, and you got new entry in by efficient competitors like Ryanair, enormous productivity gains for consumers. It's a very positive story to tell them. Next, let me turn to um, my, my second Irish experience, which was in 1992, I gave evidence in the Master Foods case. This was ice cream exclusivity, Unilever v. Mars. I acted, I gave evidence to the High Court on behalf of the plaintiff in that case. This takes us into the realm of those cases where the dominant firm has acquired its dominant position over time in the marketplace, um, perhaps using, um, as arguably Unilever did, quite a lot of exclusive and other uh, exclusive dealing and other practices, exclusionary practices, raising rivals' costs but ultimately slightly more difficult for Article 102 to deal with because the company was able to present efficiency defenses. And in that case, famously, the Irish Supreme Court accepted those efficiency defenses. Unilever had 75% market share in the Irish ice cream market. It had installed free freezers in all the retailers, and then it said nobody else could put their ice cream into those freezers, and the Irish High Court accepted it because it owned the freezers. That exclusion was correct. The European Commission corrected that. That's a seminal case. These cases were much more difficult. Next case I give an example of is what I think is the first tech cases in Europe, which are MasterCard and Visa. MasterCard and Visa, 25 years ago when I started in enforcement, had a stranglehold over global payments. We had 10 years of antitrust enforcement in the UK and in Brussels against these companies. Very little to show for that. They were able to plead efficiencies, two-sided markets, etc. There's a salutary lesson. The UK set up a payments regulator. Tomaso reminded me he's on the board of it. This is not a criticism of you, Tomaso, but we set up a payments regulator. I was instrumental in setting up a payments regulator a decade ago because I thought antitrust had failed to deal with these monopolies. Um, Ten years later, <laughs> the stranglehold of Visa and MasterCard on payments in the UK has not changed. So I would just say to those people who think that regulation is the panacea to the failure of 102 to think actually that may be different. And while I'm on that, I might also say that I do view with a certain irony, I, I, I think I'm quite pro-enforcement, but I view with a certain irony the fact that for 20 years of my antitrust existence, antitrust regulators, and I chaired the ICN um, before Andres, um, we, we gathered around and we talked about regulators. And we mostly talked about regulators as thinking of them as captured 
inefficient, subject to creep, quite politicized. <laughs> and it's quite ironic now for me to watch competition authorities becoming regulators because we were very skeptical about them when I was an enforcer. And so I would just say my experience both with that and looking at how regulation has fared in energy and water and telecoms in the UK, I would just say um, and make a plea that actually we do need to get 102 to work well, and um, I'm going to come back to what Ben was saying, and France is a good example of this, because I think that while we may have a, a, um, uh, an interesting experiment now in big tech with regulation, I don't think that's going to deliver what people expect. And I think that we need to, need to make sure that 102 um, uh, really, really works well. One other comment I want to make about timing. I do think one of the nice things in the French example, Benoit didn't expand on this a lot, but, but, but one of his predecessors, Bruno, um, proselytized globally on um, interim measures and injunctive relief. I think one of the things that DGCOM should be doing in its review um, coming up is to really do some to address interim measures. Um, and Ingo talked about cases where you may not need to spend a lot of time talking about effects. There are a number of cases where it should be possible to change the status quo in the case very early on using intermeasures. That would speed things up. It would bring parties to the table. We get through incredibly complex um, discussions in mergers in 12 months in most jurisdictions. I think if you have interim measures, that might be a way of, of achieving that and achieving it much more quickly. I think a lot of people forget that the underlying philosophy behind Article 102 is that we, we don't use 102 to address ex ante every problem in the economy. We identify a practice, we go after the firm, and then we sanction the firm with a high fine in order to encourage others. And the purpose of 102 is to use ex post enforcement to create incentives for others to do things better in the future. That only works well if two things hold. One is that the sanction is high enough to have an incentive effect on others. And arguably, quite a lot of the fines we've imposed, um, including perhaps on some of the tech companies, were too small to have that type of um, incentive effect. The second is that the law needs to be clear. There's no point in fining people slightly randomly for doing things if the, if the precedent hasn't been established in the past. You need to establish clear precedent and clarity on what the precedent was if you want that expo system to work. And I think that's part of what's failed um, with, with 102. So in terms of where we should go, I'll be brief. I think we should make more use of interim measures and um, injunctive relief. I had a very bad experience with that in the UK. Uh, the first case, London Metal Exchange, the complainant went native, did an agreement with the defendant, and we ended up high and dry in court in 2006. We never brought another case. I, I uh, lobbied to have the law changed. It was amended in 2013. The CMA still hasn't felt able to bring a case in that space. And we have the DMCC bill going through is going to further strengthen the ability of the CMA to do interim measures. I hope that works. The second point I'd make is that the UK regime, as I've mentioned with airports, has a market investigation tool. And I, I, the minister yesterday made reference to this. And that enables us to break up a monopoly or to remedy a monopoly without... Um, without recourse to um, finding that they've, they've broken the law. Um, one of the problems with that in the historically has been that the remedies have not been very flexible, and that is something Amelia Fletcher has argued has constrained its use for tech companies in the UK. That is being addressed in the DMCC bill, so I think we're going to be able to watch what the UK does with its markets regime um, in dealing with some of these points. By the way, another benefit of that market's regime is it's able to deal with oligopoly. And, and Ben Moore mentioned increasing concentration. A lot of the concern with increasing concentration is not with monopolies, it's with actually oligopolies. And I started processes to break up um, cement oligopolies, private hospital oligopolies, bus oligopolies in the UK using, uh, using that tool. So it's a good tool and it needs to be a complement. I do think there's an argument for ex ante regulation. I do think it should follow the substantive rails of 102, of thinking about um, you know, the, the, the harm to consumers. And I, I, I think that the as efficient competitive test might be um, abused here. John Vickers made the point in a paper 20 years ago that actually a less efficient competitor can improve economic welfare. <laughs> so I don't think if you're looking at consumer welfare 
applying uh, uh, how efficient is the competitive test needs to be applied in a slavish way. I think you can do that in a clever way. And I, I think a, a, a good economist is going to apply that in, in the, the right way. Um, I am slightly skeptical um, that we don't overreach in self-preferencing. Uh, I would give the example, 20 years ago, a lot of computer manufacturers, laptop manufacturers like Dell, moved from um, external modems that were manufactured by third parties to installing the modem inside the computer. And there were a lot of complaints at that time that Dell and other companies were excluding um, a set of small firms from the market by integrating their product and self-preferencing by having their own internal um, modems inside their computers. That was actually very pro-efficient, very pro-consumer. So it's not clear to me that every example of self-preferencing is a bad thing in terms of product development and so on. So I think as we develop a law on self-preferencing, we want to make sure that we don't let it get in the way of efficient development of new products. Finally, um, you know, I would say, let's not just lose sight of, of ultimately productivity growth. My big concern about antitrust in Europe and in the UK right now is that we go down the route of rent-seeking. John Kay defined rent-seeking as wealth, appropriating wealth created by others rather than creating it yourself. And moving money around in the economy, I think, is the curse of low productivity growth in advanced development, developing economies. And I think we need to make sure that we keep antitrust um, on the path of thinking about productivity growth in the way it develops. Thank you. Thank you, John. Also very interesting and very insightful what you said. I have to comment on self-preferences and Dell. This doesn't strike me as a relevant analog analogy when I think of self-preferences or Google, for instance, because the market power that these companies had in the relevant markets are completely different. But it's interesting the historical analogy you gave, saying that you know abuse of dominance worked to break up monopolies, state-owned <laughs> monopolies, because to me it brings also a, it just a thought. So there is a, a, another dimension that is difficult to to think about, but it's there, which is a political dimension. So when these companies had clear national boundaries, they had clear national regulators, there was a sort of balance of powers in the game, you know, between regulate. Instead now, we are dealing with cases with some companies with completely transcend the national boundaries, you know? There's the size of these companies, the power of these companies, where are they located, who are they, either German, French, they are everywhere in the world. And this is something that uh, we need to think think about at least or not forget because this is a difficulty also in uh, dealing with the asymmetry of resources and all this. Um, now, thank you for waiting so patiently. Uh, so Heike Schweitzer is a, is a top scholar in law. She's a professor at Humboldt. She was one of the other advisors of the European Commission that actually produced the report in 2019 that basically led all the way to the DMA. So, so we're very grateful that the, for opening up that line of work. It's been uh, very impactful. And um, so Heike, you, you're going to tell us, uh, you, you have seen this for, for, for many years. You have a, a viewpoint, which is a very privileged one. Thank you, Tommaso. And also, thank you to Andreas Mund at the Catalan for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I don't want to focus so much on the digital uh, now, but I want to focus on the future guidelines on exclusionary abuse and ask uh, what can we expect, what can we hope for with regard to these guidelines. And I want to do so in five points, um, starting with my first point, which has already been made. <clears throat> Article 102 enforcement is currently failing at the EU level, not so much as we heard from you, Benoit, uh, at the national level. Uh, but at the EU level, and we need a more effective approach. So this now I'm plagiating Johannes Leitenberger on that. Um, so it, Article 102 enforcement is not failing because there is no enforcement at the EU level. There has been really a quite constant enforcement of a median of 2.5 decisions per year on Article 102 over a long period of time. But it is failing because uh, the duration of Article 102 proceedings has consistently and very significantly increased. Here are some numbers in the period from 2004 to 2007. The median duration of an adversarial uh, proceeding on Article 102 was uh, around five years. And in the period from seven, uh, 2016 to six, uh, 2019, the median duration was um, at 80, 80 months, which is about 7.3 years. Now, five years is already long. 7.3 uh, years is much too long. And with such a duration, Article 102 enforcement loses all its effectiveness. 
So abusive conduct will not be finished in a t or ceased in a timely fashion. There will be no good remedy available to restore competition in such a market. There will be long-term entrenchment of market power. There will be long-term effects on innovation. Um, there will be maybe negative effects on distribution. And uh, particularly, there will be no more deterrent effects, on the, no more incentive effects on the dominant company in such a case. All these negative systemic effects of this long duration of Article 102 enforcement will not be offset um, by any greater accuracy in deciding a single case. So if there is a trade-off, this is a bad trade-off. Um, so this was my first point. Second point, the question rises then, why have Article 102 enforcement proceedings become so long? And I don't think there's one single reason, single explanation for that. There are some uh, procedural explanation, so the procedural requirements at the EU level have been tightened over time, right to be heard, access to file, all this has become very complex. Maybe too little immediate, uh, intermediate uh, measures, um, uh, interim measures, sorry. Uh, so maybe that's also contributing. Um, a very different aspect is about remedies, but this is not, hasn't even meant, entered the numbers that I've just recited but we don't have a very effective remedial regime at the EU level. And then there are aspects relating to the substance of Article 102. There's a lot of uncertainty currently regarding the preconditions for finding an abuse. And we have a risk-averse commission regarding losing a case, so uh, they will do a maximum of effort to, to win their case and maybe overinvest in each single case. Also, there are the tightened requirements regarding um, the showing the proof of uh, anti-competitive effects. Of course, this will lead to long or tend to uh, lead to longer proceedings, especially if we are again very uncertain regarding the evidentiary requirements. And I will comment a bit more on that in another point. So, my third point: uh, Can future guidelines on exclusionary abuse uh, address these deficits in any effective way? And guidelines really can do only so much because the Commission is always constrained by the Union Court's case law. So there's, uh, they, they cannot go against it. Uh, we have to have a brief look at the alternatives that we would have compared to um, uh, guidelines. And to my mind, they are not very attractive. Um, these alternatives have been very insightfully summarized by Johannes Leitenberger. So we could have more DMA-like regulations in more sectors. Then we move into the area of regulation. And I don't think we, now that we have discovered the benefits of an effects-based approach, we don't want to move into the direction of uh, complete per se approaches as we did in the DMA. Um, then uh, the Council could make use of its power under Article 103 to specify the content of Article 102. But there is a political risk in that because the, uh, the Parliament is not involved. And also there's only so much that the Council could really usefully, um, uh, usefully specify. And then we could have a new competition tool at the EU level. But the new competition rule is a, maybe a good instrument to supplement Article 102 uh, enforcement but cannot, um, uh, but cannot uh, be a systematic alternative. So I think we need the guidelines, and we need to do the best we can with these guidelines. So what can they do? They can um, specify the substance to help to address this problem of uncertainty. I'll say a bit more on that in a minute. Um, and they can do uh, something on the side of ev law of evidence. And I think this is a real potential of the guidelines, and also more on that in a minute. So, my fourth point, um, substance of Article 102. What can we expect from future guidelines on exclusionary abuse? And if, you, if I just said that uh, the shift in the effects analysis from a rather abstract analysis of effects to a very concrete analysis of effects, um, if this may have contributed to the length of proceedings, I don't think the guidelines can any do anything to remedy that because this is something that's, that has entered the case law over the last 15 years. The courts have developed their own um, effects-based approach. I, I'm a bit critical of this term effects-based approach because anti -competitive, uh, Article 102 has always been about anti-competitive effects. I think it's more about the type of proof that we need for anti-competitive effects. So if we have moved from abstract to concrete, uh, which means we have a different assessment of 
risks or false positives versus risk or false negatives. This is a normative basis for the shift, which is rarely mentioned, but I think important to remember. Uh, nonetheless, whether we like it or not, this approach is there to stay, and um, so this cannot be changed in the guidelines. Um, still, there are some very vague concepts in Article 102 and, uh, which have not been fully clarified by the jurisprudence, and um, the Commission could try to clarify those concepts. Uh, firstly, there's the concept of potential anti-competitive effects. Um, we don't know to this date what this means precisely, so is this um, a more likely than not standard? But the Court of Justice has explicitly said it is not, uh, or they don't want to specify, rather. Um, so, and maybe that's quite useful even because this leaves open um, some room for balancing between the um, risk of anti-competitive effects and the size of harm that may be related to an anti-competitive effect, and that may be useful uh, in, in a given case. So I don't think we will see much clarification on that point, but maybe on the concept of competition on the merits, which has been quite prominent, become quite prominent in the case law of the Court of Justice recently. Very vague term. Uh, Tommaso, you mentioned that uh, the AEC test is not very precise. <laughs> But uh, the concept of uh, competition on the merits is even less so. Um, so I think um, the Commission will try to specify a bit. We know, uh, we, we know a bit more today about competition on the merits, that it's a broader concept and a more normative concept uh, than the AEC test. Um, I think we can also specify some types of contact that are not competitive competition on the merits, but we will never be able to really positively define what competition on the merits is. So also there, I think, a limited room for precision in the guidelines. So I come to my last point, um, five, uh, what is the room on the side of the law on evidence? Can something usefully be done on that side in order to lead to shorter and more effective proceedings. And I think here is the real potential for the guidelines. The guidelines can do quite a bit here. Uh, we have seen quite a lot of case law which has dealt with evidential requirements regarding Article 102 recently, but we have no conceptual clarity at all and not even clarity at the terminologi terminolo terminological level. And I think this is really badly needed. Um, so if we discuss these days about evidential requirements, the debate frequently is, you mentioned it, Tommaso, about um, uh, presumptions. Uh, but the term presumptions is quite imprecise. We have very, it's a, you can use it in a way as, an, as a word that means all the types of inferences that we can have, or you can use it in a narrow sense, legal presumptions. Um, uh, and then we have irrebuttable and rebuttable presumptions where, where the rebuttable presumptions lead to full reversal of proof if you use it as a legal, uh, legal term. Now what we have seen in the Intel case is that uh, the, court, uh, the Court of Justice will no longer accept irrebuttable, irrebuttable presumptions linked just to conduct um, uh, as an indicia for an inference for finding anti-competitive effects. And uh, instead, the, court, the general court has told us uh, the Court of Justice has led the way towards rebuttable presumptions. I don't think that Intel told us uh, it's now about rebuttable presumptions because it's not a full reversal of proof that we see in these cases. It's rather about factual inferences or what you, um, Professor Kirchhoff, told, uh, called factual presumptions. Um, so I think uh, we have to be clear here because um, presumption, the legal term presumptions, is something about, has a normative basis. We want to abbreviate, facilitate evidence with a view to a certain normative goal. Maybe elicit information from the other party, maybe facilitate enforcement. And therefore we accept less on the empirical side. And I don't think that guidelines can do anything with regard to these types of presumptions um, when it comes to presumptions based on conduct. Because co the court has told us, based on conduct, these types of presumptions will no longer be accepted. But what the, the guidelines can do is clarify in which, which types of cases we can have factual inferences. And this, is, uh, this you already mentioned in your contribution. 
uh, factual inferences are about a high probability that a certain type of conduct, plus maybe other factors, for example, degree of dominance, coverage of a practice, and so on, lead to certain anti-competitive effects. And the guidelines can very usefully help us to clarify some of these cases where we can use factual inferences. Of course, because it's empirical, it's not normative, we need the economists to tell us when do we have, when is such an inference justified? Uh, but I think this would be extremely useful to have more guidance on these factual inferences in Article 102 cases because this can really facilitate enforcement. Um, then I've just said we don't have any irrebuttable presumptions anymore about conduct leading to anti-competitive effects, but there are other types of presumptions. So presumptions based on the object of a conduct or the intent maybe, and um, as far as I understand, we have come to call these naked uh, cases of naked exclusion. And in a case of naked exclusion, which basically means that there is no other, uh, no um, economic sense in this type of practice but to uh, obstruct competitors, in such a case, the Commission is not required to prove effects at all. So here we have an ir irrebuttable presumption, and that can be very useful if we know more about when do we have naked cases of naked exclusion. Um, there are some hints already in the uh, 2008 guidance paper or the priorities guidance, um, but I think more can be done in the new guidelines. One important question here is, can we apply this concept of naked exclusion all, all, only in those cases where there is clearly no economic sense at all in a certain type of conduct, or can we also apply it in cases where we can see there's some minimal economic sense but uh, completely out of proportion to the anti-competitive effects, or there are less, uh, less restrictive alternatives to the type of conduct to achieve the same efficiencies. If we can use the concept of a naked exclusion also in these cases, it has a much broader uh, scope of application and also can facilitate enforcement. Of course, you need some effects analysis in order to compare, um, uh, but it can be a, an abbreviated form of an effects analysis. Third is a third category where I think we can really have more efficient and more efficient application of, um, of Article 102 with the help of the law and evidence is about competition on the merits. Now, I just said competition on the merits, we cannot define in a positive way to say this is competition on the merits. This, help, this is the one criterion that helps us to distinguish competition on the merits or no competition on the merits. But we, sometimes we can say there is a conduct that is clearly not competition on the merits. For example, conduct which is illegal, maybe because it violates data protection laws. Uh, so in this case, um, this is not yet a good competition law case because it's really firstly a data protection case. But if we can find that this type of conduct also has plausible anti-competitive effects, in that case it can become a competition case. Now the question is what do we need to prove anti-competitive effects in such a case? Do we need to have, have the full proof of concrete anti-competitive effects or can it suffice to have a more abstract proof of effects, a plausibility of anti-competitive effects, which again could facilitate enforcement in these types of settings. So this is what the Bundeskartellamt did in the Facebook case, and uh, I think this is something which, which could have broader application, application if you think a bit more in depth about uh, the scope of this category. So these are my remarks. Thank you, Heike. Um, lots of interesting points you made. Uh, I have to revisit my earlier comment to Wolfgang when he said that four and a half years the duration of a proceeding is not that bad. Given the figures that you presented, which we are in excess of seven, what Wolfgang has in mind would be a huge improvement, actually, to, to, this, to the status quo. And also a clarification, I don't think, as an economist, that there's, as efficient competitor test is uh, not very precise. I think it can be precisely wrong for the reasons that John said. In many cases, you may want less efficient competitors because they compete and they bring their prices down and that's just in the interest of consumers. So the, the test is often flawed in itself, irrespective of data. I wanna, um, the, I wanna ask Andreas, we started 10 minutes late, can I take five minutes out of the coffee break? Great, so now it's, uh, 
its responses, I would like to give uh, an opportunity to all yeah. of you. Um, yeah, maybe an idea that everybody of us uh, can uh, distribute, uh, contribute a final remark. Yes, so that yes, can, that's a, then, it's a uh, self-moderating panel. I love let me, it. So, <laughs> so let me, let me, yeah, let, let me, let me only start uh, with, uh, let's say, um, uh, some quotes from uh, the contributions of the other which I liked because there was not so much which I did not like. So from Benoit, I really liked uh, to be pragmatic and flexible at advice for an NCA mm -hmm. for courts that is limited, that is clear, because we have to stick to the rule of law, but in, in uh, let's say, in the frame well, we, we, uh, also we have, have in the procedural frame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. No, but you have we, we, opportunity. We try uh, to stick yeah. with the rule of law, you know. <laughs> that, is, that is clear, but uh, the rules are different, of course. Um, then uh, from, from Ingo, he clarified that the average time is three, and, uh, three to three and a half years only in Germany, so that is very good. We are not so bad. And um, John has stressed uh, the importance of uh, interim uh, measures, and I think uh, where that is appropriate, that is really a good idea uh, to, to come with interim measures. And he also said um, that um, a less efficient competitor may improve competition. I think that is also very important to have that in mind. And uh, finally, that clearly um, I share the views of uh, Heike in the context of factual assumptions. And um, it would be helpful if we can find more guidance in the new horizontal uh, guidelines of the gu guidance in the new horizontal guidelines of the Commission. Um, the question will be to what extent can that really be based on economics and is the economics behind that conclusive? And what did you not like? I started. <laughs> no, 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 okay. You don't have like to say that. Maybe everything, no, no at coffee break, you can tell me first. Yeah, yeah. um, Benoit. Yeah, so I understand this panel is self organizing, and I guess, I guess we, don't, we don't need a, a, an as efficient panelist test. Um, all great. So, um, no, just, just to react to uh, a couple of things I've heard from uh, first from Ingo on, uh, on ATT. Which, which is a very important case. Uh, so I can reassure you that there has been uh, extensive uh, uh, dialogue uh, between NCAs uh, uh, on this case. So uh, we certainly try to, uh, to achieve as much uh, consistency as we can in the, uh, in the outcome. Now, there is one, one, one institutional issue or governance issue with ATT which is interesting, which is that it's it's fundamentally about the interaction between competition law and, uh, and, and, and privacy law, as you know. Uh, I mean, that's, for any of you who wouldn't know the case, that's about whether or not uh, the, uh, the consent framework on the App Store um, discriminates against, against uh, third-party apps, to put it shortly, whether or not, so I'm not you know, concluding. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and privacy uh, enforcement is national. So if you, I mean, that's a very important case and which ideally should be, should be decided at European level, but uh, who would be the, the interlocutor of the commission to, uh, to discuss the interaction between, is that the, is that the, uh, is that the European Privacy Board, is that anyone else, I, I don't know. So if you want to reach more consistency in the future, you would also need some alignment in governance between uh, a competition and, and uh, privacy, which today we don't have, but that's a broader discussion. Um, second, on uh, interim measures, uh, I mean, absolutely, I mean, we've, we've, we've uh, 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 interim measures uh, uh, can, can very significantly shorten the, uh, the proceedings. Uh, on average, uh, in the past, uh, the average length of our proceedings for interim measures had been six months. So just to be compared with the numbers we've just heard, six months. Uh, in the uh, Google case on, on publishers' rights, it took seven months. In the uh, Meta case last year, it took five months. So, of course, then you, need, you still need to, to, of course, to decide on substance. Uh, but if you back to the back, back to which on, for Meta we haven't done yet, but for Google, uh, including the fact that Google did not apply the interim measures, and so we, we had an additional round of you know sanctions, sanctioning for not uh, not enforcing the interim measures. Um, back in 2021, including that episode, that unfortunate episode, uh, the total proceedings uh, were uh, less than three years. Total proceedings. 
for the up and it ended with commitments, as you know, not with the sanction. Uh, so uh, certainly, as part of the discussion on the uh, on the review of uh, Regulation One, I mean, uh, I would I would encourage very much. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Commission to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to try and change uh, the way they approach uh, uh, pro uh, uh, temporary measures, as, as they call them, and to try to uh, make a, a collective effort to, uh, to, uh, to align the standard. And in, in, under French law, the standard is about uh, serious and, uh, and immediate harm, which is slightly uh, easier than what the Commission has, as you know. So I think that's, that's for me the main goal of the, of the, of the review of, regula of Regulation 1. All the rest might be useful, but you know, I think that's the most important uh, in the whole discussion. Um, second, on, uh, and finally, on, um, on um, regulation, uh, John. Uh, yes, regulation has been uh, frustrating sometimes. Uh, yes, I definitely think, believe that uh, uh, antitrust enforcers should not try to become regulators. And, um, and doing too much commitments, you know, kind of uh, sends you uh, down that slippery way towards becoming a regulator, uh, behavioral commitments, uh, and behavioral remedies. Uh, so we should be very, very uh, 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 careful about that. I think even the DMA has a risk of uh, turning DigiComp into a regulator, which wouldn't be good news, I think, in, uh, in, in sociological terms, you know. Because when you're a regulator, you've got to, uh, to uh, go for lunch with, uh, with the companies you regulate and so on. Uh, I, I don't want to do that. Uh, I hope DigiComp will not be doing that too much. Uh, but, but there can be a useful complementarity. So it's not about antitrust becoming regulation. It's about finding the right complementarity between antitrust and regulation. And I think that's the way forward. And I stop here. Thank you, Benoit. Ingo. And just one remark to, to Heike. And I, I found it extremely uh, illuminating um, what you said about the categories of, of the different kinds of, of presumption. Um, I, I would like to make a comment uh, exclusively on, on one point. Um, you were, I understand, a little skeptical that uh, the Commission would be bound by the case law of, of the Court of Justice um, very strongly, which is certainly right, of course. Uh, on the other hand, I think we have seen over the last decades uh, that the Court and the Court of Justice both have been, I wouldn't say flexible, but nevertheless open to mm. some new considerations, uh, also new policies which, which uh, have been developed and then enforced um, uh, by, by, by the European Commission. And I would be a little more optimistic that uh, this is also something, if the Commission forms a certain perspective, um, the court, I wouldn't say almost automatically would follow, but nevertheless would consider very carefully whether this is a feasible, practical approach which should be considered in the courts as well. John, there is something that you really wanted to say, and I, now I, you can I, say it. I'm going to just make three very quick comments. Um, in in Heike's category of naked exclusion, um, cheap exclusion, where it doesn't cost the firm much to raise rivals' costs, is a really nice example of that, and it's a well-developed concept in the United States. Secondly, on interim measures, even for the companies, sometimes taking a plaster off quickly is better than taking it off slowly. So even for the companies, just having clarity. Mm. So uh, with Benoit, with the, with the, with, the with the cases you're doing, I, I much prefer that because let, let you be right or wrong, but whether you're right or wrong, as Heike said, may not be affected by whether you take an extra five years um, to decide it. Finally, on something you said, Tommaso, about the ability of national competition authorities to address global issues. Um, I, would, I would say the... the um, CMA, and I, I don't want to be critical, but the CMA really messed this up with audit. The audit market globally has four firms. There's very little competition because most firms can't choose the one that's their consulting firm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the CMA did a market study. It could have done a market investigation. It could have called for the the, the separation. It's a, it's a it's sort of vertical or conglomerate separation of consulting from audit. Um, it didn't do that. It, was sh it shied away from it. It should have done it, in my view. It's a, it's a rotten market. It's a, a, a really good example of a, co a market where competition doesn't work. And, and then EY went to try and break itself up. But actually, I think if the OFT or the CMA had said that, and the, actually the Australians might have followed, others might have followed, I do think where you've got a very clear case of a market where competition is not working, where you need a structural remedy, Competition authorities need to step up and be bolder in taking some international leadership, and then others will follow, and you might get a result. And audit is one is I think the crying example of a market I would like to see restructured um, for for the benefit of greater competition. And and yet competition authorities have been shy on that. And so my plea would be the competition authorities. It needs to be clear cut, but if it's clear cut, they should be bolder. 
I can have the last word. I have nothing so urgent to say that it should, should stay in the way of the break. <laughs> thank you for your wisdom and thank you for everybody.